Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started with session 17 of 120C, 220C. We're actually amazingly close to the end of the quarter, as we did now, because uh, we don't actually have a session 20. There's the uh, titles week and the timing, and next Monday is a holiday, and like we're, we're just like uh, moving full speed ahead toward the end. And we'll try to go through and get some things together and finish up in a nice way. Because we want this to sort of uh, be fun for you at the end as opposed to uh, seeing another kind of major drudge through a huge project. So we're going to go ahead and introduce a new project today that hopefully you'll have some fun with. It's really intended to be this kind of more of an experimentation as opposed to uh, kind of something where, oh, it's really an incredible lot of analysis behind it or something like that. So we'll talk about assignment five in just a second. Okay. In terms of where we're overall going today, we're going to keep on talking about oh, different ways of approaching searching for solutions, looking at the whole genetic approach some more. We sort of looked at moving points around to try and figure out oh, really what the minimum height on a surface was and to try and test uh, using the genetic algorithm to find that lowest point. We're going to try something a little bit different today. We're going to look at a bunch of different building forms and trying to use the same sort of genetic approach to evaluate a bunch of different potential building forms simultaneously to figure out oh, which ones are giving us the best evaluation values on any number of metrics. And we'll keep to some of the simple geometric ones at first, but then we're going to move on to kind of thinking about more analysis results and kind of things that come out of there. So two parts today, we're going to spend a lot of time kind of a mock mode doing multiple building forms. But then I want to start heading into its other analysis packages that are available for us to work with and evaluate forms. In particular, there are some energy analysis nodes, which are very interesting to work with, which will help us go through and for any either a conceptual form or a detailed form, let you figure out the EUI, the total energy use, all those different things that oh, the DOE 2.2 engine ultimately reports out. So all those things we typically get at through it. There's also a node that lets you go after getting daylighting values. Okay? And that uses the rendering engine to go through and compute uh, just the amount of daylighting hitting a surface above the floor kind of based on the different characteristics of the walls and the windows and all that. And both those are sort of examples of kind of web-based evaluation. So something that we aren't doing sort of directly on a computer, but depend on some web services to work with. 17.5 uh, actually integrates those two together. Kind of for a simple little building where what we do is just kind of fluctuate or flex and change the uh, uh, window height, the window widths, and based on that, go through and sort of see how many energy use and the daylighting values change. But we're going to start with these basic building things. But even before we get into comparing the different building forms, let's just go ahead and start off with our final assignment and really talk about that for just a second. It is posted out there on Canvas. So go ahead and take a look if you can. It's hanging around out there as assignment five. And I kind of cast this as a challenge. We're trying to actually get involved into a series of challenges that are sort of being completed at different schools all together. We're just uh, testing this one for now to sort of see uh, you know, if we want to sort of start integrating into something where we're actually doing some work comparing our results to some Georgia Tech and some Texas A&M students. But what we're going to do with this one as a starting point is just kind of take oh, the idea of a residential tower that could be built in San Francisco and just try flexing it and forming it and just really see what we might come up with as recommendations for how the actual tower could be shaped. So it has two different components. You know, ultimately, for a lot of people who are traveling or doing different things next week, the final submission date where you have to get it all just kind of turned in is going to be on Thursday, June 2nd, so just right before finals week. Just get things bundled up and turned on cam in Canvas to so in good shape there. However, in class next Tuesday, for people who have been working on it so far, we'll compare where people are. I'm just sort of really curious. We all have the same basic design problem, and it'd be great to sort of kind of compare different people's metrics and what they're coming up with and what they're recommending. So that's kind of to give you a little bit of a brief as to uh, what the project's all about. The idea is you're going to be recommending a proposed design to the developers of a new residential project. Okay, you're going to evaluate some different forms and ultimately kind of recommend what you think would be the best form. 
So it's going to be located in San Francisco in the Transbay Terminal. And several of you are familiar with that because you worked on a site very close to there as part of the Capstone Project in CE. Um, it has a good view of the waterfront and the Bay Bridge. It's actually a really nice area of the city. It's growing very rapidly. Um, they'll have a pretty big site to work with, 300 by 450, which is like three quarters of a very large block. That's actually plenty of space to work with for what you want to do. Height limitation is 750 feet, so you don't have to go that tall, but you can if you want to think about a single <coughs> tall tower. But you could also think about actually having a more distributed scheme. You could have several smaller towers, or you could have a lower building where part of it's a tower, or you can kind of combine these together in any different way you might imagine. Because having single tall towers while they get great views aren't necessarily always the most efficient forms. So you kind of think about it in a number of different ways. It's good to think about it in a number of different ways, because I'm sort of interested here in the breadth of the different solutions you consider, in addition to sort of what you sort of come up with as your ultimate. So think broadly about how to approach this, and think about different sort of forms, whether they be rectangular, or circular, or triangular, or combinations thereof. You can have a lot of fun. Okay. Your job is to evaluate an alternatives and recommend a form, or several forms, and again, it doesn't have to be a single tower, that provides somewhere between a million two and a million five square feet. You know, it's a pretty broad uh, direction. You just ultimately have to go through and provide some new square footage that we're going to be ultimately selling off as some sort of residential units. Okay, the idea is to evaluate some alternative scenarios. I'm recommending around 10. And I say you can do that automatically or manually because to some extent you can put those in list maps or while loops or something like that. But if you want to go through and just play with some values that are kind of extreme manually just by physically plugging in some different input parameters, try that too. Okay. In this case, we're definitely not going exhaustive. Okay. So it's almost, if you want to sort of just manually shoot in the dark at different sort of combinations that we would ultimately say, oh, that was kind of interesting, now start going in more exhaustively we could. But for right now, just kind of evaluate 10 different scenarios. Okay, so you'll have some input parameters and some results that come out of it. And report the parameter values considered, so what you change is your inputs, as well as the evaluation metrics, those results. Then rank your top three and recommend the one that you consider to be the best, whatever that is. Okay, and that's up to an awful lot of interpretation. So your rationale about why you think one is better than another is uh, perfectly valid to kind of throw onto the table. So as you do this, you know, there are all sorts of things we could look at in terms of the building geometry, you know, so the total height of the buildings, the total volume of the buildings, the total floor area, those will be things that we can get out of Revit fairly easily. Okay. We're going to learn about how to actually project the annual energy use, and as we talked about in our notes, solar insulation potential yeah. in terms of the surfaces. But also even open space preserved on site is something you often want to consider as you're thinking about trying to develop a site because oh, you know, that makes sort of a, that's one of the trade-offs that goes into I have a very tall tower with great views, bad energy use, and a lot of open space on site, or I can spread it all across the site and typically have something that's more energy efficient but actually is sacrificing a lot of the on-site space. So these are all just sort of different metrics. So each of these different things just has a number associated with it. So ultimately, you know, you're going to come up with just really a table with a bunch of numbers, and it could be that of Dymo, or it could be put in Excel, whatever you want, to kind of compare your alternatives. On the economic side, I would recommend, just for simplicity, going with a formula that looks something like this. We'll just sort of assume some linear relationship between the cost of building something near the ground versus the cost of building something very high off the ground. So anywhere from 500 per square feet if we're at zero to $1,000 per square foot if we're at 750. So there's just some linear relationships. So based on what level you are, if I have, oh, you know, 10,000 square feet at 375 feet above the ground, I take the 10,000 square feet and then multiply it halfway between at $750 per square foot. So it's a linear relationship between those. Now, costs not only get higher when you go up much higher, but actually the sales value goes up quite a bit too. So having that penthouse apartment is probably worth a lot more per square foot than the ones that are closer to the ground. 
Okay? And it's just part of the trade-off that people make when they go through and try and figure out these forms. So these are just some metrics to go and take a look at. Yeah. If we were really going to go through and look at this project, some other things people could look at. You can sort of get into the whole relationship of, oh, just you know, how much clear glass you have versus very, being very, very deep into the building, so how close you are to an outside wall. We could also look at something where, oh, you sort of say that if these are somewhere near the Bay Bridge or the water, that apartments that have a view of the water, or particularly of the Bay Bridge, would be more valuable than those. Okay. There's any number of ways you can kind of keep on extending it. But for now, just kind of keep it simple, just so that we uh, have a basis that we can always go through and extend. Okay, because I don't want you to get too deep ended on this for this last week. Okay, so everyone is going to set up a building model or building models to be flexed. And you can use any of those forms we've been looking at. We have boxes, twisting rectangular masses, twisting triangular masses, freedom towers, or some shape that you want to work with. Could be any shape. But you're going to have some sort of shape that we can flex a little bit. You're going to basically, if you want to set some initial values that are going to be held constant or set up some relationship, you know, like I always, I keep on setting up this tapering where the taper is constant. Kind of setting them, you know, whatever it is that you want to go through and go ahead and hold this constant, then add some new levels as needed because you want to basically uh, divide um, into floor areas so we can go through and report that. Set the project location. That would be important relative to the sun and the energy use and things like that. So just get yourself set up to flex. Next up, you're going to set up some logic to test a series of values as inputs. Okay. And when you test those, you can use a list map to iterate for series input values or manually set the input values. You can kind of go either way with that. So if you have something that's really easy to flex through Dynamo, either as a single list or as a pair of options, yeah, go ahead and do those. But try to keep it relatively simple. As you're flexing, flex one or two values at a time. Don't flex five values at a time, because then it gets really hard to sort of figure out what's going on. So see if you can flex a little and develop some intuition about which of the factors seems to be the ones that take you in the best direction. Okay. Finally, you're going to just report those values. So you're going to run a series of test cases and report the input values and the evaluation metrics using Dynamo, Excel, or some combination. Rank the top three and recommend the one that you consider to be best. Okay. So that's it. Okay. So. Flex that tower or multiple towers, figure out what you're going to recommend, and then just have a rationale. You know, and that rationale could be that, oh, for example, you know, I'm going to go through and really market these units as being ultimate and sustainable living as well as close to the city. So sustainability is going to be a big edge in terms of you know, the overall value of the project and sort of the, how people will sort of think it's very different and very valuable. So therefore, I might go ahead and really put a premium on the sustainable performance at the expense of the cost. You know, so, or you could decide that you're going to go very economically driven and you just went for the lowest cost strategy for going ahead and provide the maximum number of units, you know, quite independent of the operating costs. Or you can say, I was really going to go through and bias towards waterfront views. So I really came up with a form that really kind of maximizes the number of apartments that have a good view of the water. Like that. Yeah. Any of those rationale are fine. Just you know, as you're optimizing, you always have some rationale that makes you say one is better than the other, and that's really one of the object lessons of this course is we can evaluate any number of things, but what you actually do logically to make sense of all those evaluations is where the art comes into this. Super. If you're for four units, it'd be great if you could go one step further and actually panelize the facade using some panel, and it could be a rectangular seamless panel or one with an opening, just something going on, and then provide some visual feedback that show how one of your metrics or a combination, you can do the solar insulation or some other rating that you sort of hybridly compute, but you have some way of evaluating you know, the different facade panels and basically using the little light ratings to apply a color gradient to the panels, indicating the desirability of that location in the building. So if you were all about view, I would expect that your panels up near the top would really have very strong view of coloration. The ones down near the bottom might not. Yeah. So as you're working on this, in fact, you know, you're working on this whole notion of some towers that you're building. 
if you want to think about there actually being adjacent buildings, please don't have that in there. You can go through and put some buildings around it that are blocking the views at the lower floors. Yeah, that'll give you a little more realism in terms of views and solar insulation and stuff like that. So uh, feel free to go through and kind of, you know, just add to the model to go ahead and make it more realistic to the extent you want to. Okay, when you get all done, you're basically going to do what you've been doing in the past. Just copy those things on up, give us a link, and ultimately put a little design journal entry together that just sort of talks about, you know, kind of what your final recommendation, what you flexed and what your recommendation was. Does that make sense? Okay, beautiful. So again, this is one, you know, it's purposely designed in such a way that I don't want you to deep end on it. It's really more just to get the sense of going through a lot of different metrics and pulling values out and comparing them. Mr. Jordan. Do we have a constraint on floor to floor height? Um, let's just kind of think about what would be realistic. Okay, so floor to floor height on a residential tower. But it's, you know, it's going to be greater than 10, but probably oh, less than 15. It's somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah. Use the number that you sort of feel comfortable with. Okay. You need, well, the space in between has to be counted within that number, because we're not, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's so what I'm saying. Floor, floor, floor to floor height is not a Oh, okay. It's floor not sandwich. Really yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So you want at least eight foot clear, a nice you know, luxury apartment, maybe 10 foot clear would be great. And then you have that little bit of space for the structure and all that. That's why, I know it's, it's probably like, I, 14 is probably a reasonable number, but yeah, it could vary a little bit. Yeah. And then when you say solar insulation, do you mean in terms of the roof or <laughs> solar panels, or are you saying solar insulation is like all of the facades? Actually, think about all of the facades as having that potential. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? In what sense? Well, I mean, you're gonna, here, you're probably gonna get some free heating on the south side, but I'm just saying, oh, when well, you say solar potential, is that a good metric? If you, the, the more, what? the better, or is it the less, the better? Well, that's a very good question, and maybe that even gets into your final evaluation. If we thought, uh, I'm gonna think about it in a positive way, as though, let's say we even had really high performance glass that could actually go through and use that energy and convert it into you know, like solar yeah. energy or something like that. So I'll imagine like uh, 10 years from now when this thing actually gets built, okay. we might have that technology. So I'm gonna think about it in a very positive sense. Because I live on the north side of the building, and yeah. I think of it as very nice that I'm not on the south side of the building because we don't have air conditioning very sure. often in residential buildings. Sure. In California. Or I, I think that's a perfectly valid way to think about it. Okay. So but, that, yeah. But you want us to think of it as a positive thing. Um, okay. Just either way, explain it in your rationale. Because okay. I think it's a very valid point that, you know, sometimes we like the sun, sometimes we don't like the sun. It just really depends on, uh, yeah, it's not that we don't like it. It just sort of either serves our purposes or doesn't serve our purpose. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that's kind of a choice. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Generally pretty good? Have a sense? Okay, yeah. again, don't go too awfully crazy. I know there's some wild architects in this room that are gonna like uh, potentially go and uh, do something that's very, very uh, kind of interesting and have very high aesthetic scores. Okay, but you know, you can, but don't feel that you have to, you know, in terms of that, because it's really more just going through the exercise of doing this and sort of seeing what you come up with. Okay. You could always make it more complex later. Okay, let us then flip back over here. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to keep on talking about our building forms and kind of flexing different building forms and trying to look at how to consider several at a time. We've been looking at how we use list maps or while loops to go through and constrain things. Okay, this whole notion of the genetic algorithms looks pretty interesting. Okay. But with the genetic algorithms, let's go ahead and kind of take it one step further in terms of thinking about how it could actually apply to buildings as opposed to points on the on surface. So where we had left off, we were sort of playing around with this uh, genetic algorithm package called Optimo. And within Optimo, it reported or it went through a series of different iterations and we were basically moving points around based on populations and where those populations ended up in reporting back values about what the height was. So there's kind of a little progression that I'll walk you through here pretty quickly in terms of how we went from the original file, the original file that Muhammad provided as an example, to kind of adding just a little more 
feedback to it is really what I would say. I didn't more than anything to that, but it's useful when we use that for our building too. Where what we did was from his original example, it went through, did the optimization, and then just like our reported value, we started by adding some reference points at the end, which would show where those points were. We then got into this notion of transposing the CSV file, just because if you look at the way the data file is organized, the way it comes out of Optimo, it's not exactly the most, oh, what is it, friendly format. So transposing it gives us a little bit more putting things in rows and columns. Capturing the results on each loop was all about saying, as opposed to only doing it at the very tail end, let's do it for every intermediate one. Redrawing the points on each loop and finally just capturing the snapshots. So I'm just going to walk you through this one real quickly and we'll think about how that applies. So we are going to go over to 17.1. Let's see if we can find those minimum uh, points. I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, Dynamo right now. Hang on, let me pop back out of Dynamo and get back to Revit. So the idea here is I'm going to open the metric one. Again, that's just a scaling thing. Okay, I've got my little surface here. My little surface is looking fine. You might remember we had that little surface. We were trying to figure out what the minimum point was. Our eyes are pretty good at spotting that, but teaching a computer to spot that takes a little bit more work. So what we're going to do is use Dynamo to help us. And I say, it's kind of interesting. I say our eyes have an easy time spotting that, which I think is generally true. We're pretty good in when we see things moving towards like some optimum or some point, our eyes are pretty good at figuring out what's happening with motion and stuff like that. That's part of why I just spend a lot of time thinking about how to provide visual feedback. Because I think, you know, we have a much easier time when we see the color gradients sort of zooming in. Oh, that looks interesting over in that corner, as opposed to looking at big tables and numbers. So that's really uh, what's going on with a lot of this. Okay, so again, if I started with 1B, but we'll kind of move past this pretty quickly. What's happening here is this is the part where we just go through and set up the points, and we are setting up a bunch of XY points. Again, those XY points are varying anywhere from 0 to 90. There's lower limits on every input value. There's upper limits on every input value, 0 to 90. What this is going to do is make pairs that go from 0 to 90, so XY pairs, that get sent to this point on surface next assumption. And what this does is for all the pairs that come in here, it evaluates every pair of XYs and say, if you intersect that XY location with the surface, what's the Z value? Okay. So that's what this function of Y does. What happens is out of this, this fitness <coughs> function results function takes the population list, the inputs, takes the fitness functions, these back over here, and ultimately uses it to go through and regenerate kind of a next generation based on the results. It goes through and does what it needs to. It's going to go through six iterations. In this case, what's going on here? Our initial value is one. That should sort of make sense. Okay. And it's going to go through six iterations. So if you don't have these nodes, or these nodes are looking a little bit red to you because it's not loaded on your machine, again, what you need to do is go under packages and search for the Optimo. Most of you are in the same seats for we last week. So do most of you have Optimo? You in good shape? Yeah. You're good. Okay. No, let's get you now. We'll get that there. I'll just go through and run this in the meantime, and you will see. Again, what's happening at the tail end of 1B is as follows. It's going to go through and loop. That's all fine. Boop, 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 boop. Get to the end. At the end of it all, I'm going to go through and do two different things. I'm going to go through and write out the data. Okay. That's going to be the data from the very last iteration. Okay. 
And I'm also going to take that data from the very last iteration and put points out there, point by coordinates, and put the reference points on the surface. Okay. So, a couple different things to do here. Let's go through and give this actually a value just so we have a place to write the text file. So, I'm going to put it out there on my desktop. I'll call it example 171b.txt. Just has a place to write that file. So again, here's what's going to happen. If I run this through, say, three iterations, let's let that run. It's doing its thing. What it should do is run through three iterations and then stop. It's going to fail when it gets to more than three iterations. Okay, it says run completed. You'll see here are the points that have been located at the end of the third iteration. So let's take a look at what Optimo is providing. The idea is as follows. When this thing is busy looping, the result is as follows. It's going through and the loop is providing as the zero thing that comes out of the loop is providing this iteration number. So that's the third iteration. Okay. It's going to also go through and provide, there's really three lists in that second list. There's list zero, which is the x values, list y, which is the one, uh, one which is the y values, and two is the z values. So the way to interpret this is input value one, input value two, you know, fitness function one. Okay, because that's the way we set it up. One fitness function, two input values. Super. These values all came out, but these values look kind of uh, hard to follow. So we take A1, that is the second list, and I take all those different points, okay, the zero in the first and the second, and basically make X, Y, Z points at them and make reference points. That's how those points show up. The other thing that happens over here, though, is we write a text file. It's 171B. I'm writing it to a little CSV text file. So let us take a look at what that looks like, just so you get an idea. Where is that? OK, desktop. Open that up. So check out this good looking file. We have, oh, x values, y values, and z values. The way it writes it out is it actually writes out all the x values as one line, the y values as one line, and the z values as one line. Okay. So my first thing was, hmm, it'd be nice if we transpose that, just so we got the pairs of x, y's, and z's together. Okay. So that's a real easy little step. And if you even want to see that, that's all I do in one C is I just go through and change that. But if we want to just do that right here, you know how to do a list transpose. So you can open 1C, or we'll just do the list transpose right here. I'll say list transpose. Where'd it go? There it is. So basically, I'm going to take all that fabulous A1 data as a list and just transpose it and write that out instead. Okay. I'm going to make that, as opposed to 1B, I'm going to make it 171C. OK, I'll go through and run that instead. Oh, for this time, how about, oh, what can I do? I'm going to slide you over just so I see you better. Maybe I'll run four iterations this time. OK, looks like four is done. The points are a little more consolidated down there. Uh, in terms of the example, though, let's see if I can find it. The file we wanted to be 171C. 
Let's check that out. Okay, so that's just looking a little bit better. Yeah. Just a little bit nicer to the form we like to see that. We can just as easily put that to Excel file, or something like that. Okay, so the idea in this path was really, okay, we'll start by just, um, we added the reference points, we transposed the file. The next idea would be, could we actually capture the results on each loop? Because, well, it's kind of cool to have the final result, which is theoretically the end of the optimization, yeah, Jordan and I were talking at the end of class last time. It'd be nice to sort of see it converge and kind of move on down and get a sense of how far it's converging. Maybe even then we could do something where, oh, based upon how close the points are, we could have some sort of well loop, which is saying, well, the difference is greater than a certain amount. Keep on going, but as soon as the distance gets smaller than a certain deviation, then yeah, then we could actually stop converging. So we can try to get smart about this. So capturing the results on each loop and even redrawing the points on each loop, let's get an open 4B. It will really be oh, kind of those two different things implemented. <coughs> let's go back over. Close that guy up. How about over in Dynamo land, let's just open 4B. That has two changes. Again, writing out the results on each loop as well as capture or moving the points to each loop. So we did this just a little bit differently over here. What's happening here is, oh, what's going on here? We have this whole notion of recording the results on each loop. The idea is, as opposed to going through and recording the results uh, just at the tail end, after we get to the A1 when the loop is done, what if we actually sort of put the part where we wrote out the file in as part of the loop? Okay. And we did that in a couple of different ways. I could do it here as part of the while, or I could do it as part of the body. I'll go ahead and show you this way, which is we did it as part of the body. I have a function which is going to do nothing but if you give me the results data file, I'm going to go through and just basically grab the last guy. I'm going to go through and record the results to a CSV file and also uh, move the points around. So let's take a look at that. Up here, let's just point this file at something reasonable. I'll call it out on my desktop. I'll call it 17.1, where are we now? Is it D? <coughs> and, or 4B. I have a very funny numbering scheme that makes no sense at this point. And I'll come back over here and I'll say edit the custom node. Let's see what we got going on in that node. What we're going to do is, based on some value, some results data file, we're going to read that CSV file. Oh, even here, I'm going to worry about this in a little bit because this notion with the ifs up here tends not to work for me, so I might clean it up just a little bit. What we are going to do is take those values out. I'm going to get the item of two different things. Item zero is the iteration number. That's going up here. We're going to get rid of that in just a second. Item one is the actual data file. The data file is coming down over here. And basically, the data, the x, y, z's, that's the first value, OK? We're going to basically pull the point by coordinates. So that's going to get it out of that current iteration. We're also going to transpose it. OK, what is it here? Get the number of items, list map it. And what is all this doing? I'll think about what this is doing for just a second. For each item, I am basically going to go through and what is it? Get the item at that index and add the item to the front, which I think has the effect of, oh, the previous file is over there. I think the main thing what this is doing is basically adding the file, the, the data values to the tail end. Well, let us just sort of see how this all works, and ultimately I'm joining it back together. I'm a little concerned about this, just because what's happened to me in a lot of my examples is if ifs are buried alive inside of the, uh, the notes, the custom notes, they often don't work. So 
So let's see if this is actually going to do what I want it to. Okay. The tail end is it should reside out of the CSV file. But let's see, make sure. Okay, we'll try running it, and then if it doesn't work, we'll do a little patchwork on it, eliminate the things that I think are probably creating problems. So again, we have the same basic structure. The difference is now, as opposed to just going through and uh, recasting the next generation, we're actually going to try to record those results every time. Okay, let's run that and see how that looks. You'll notice this is a little bit different because what it's doing is actually showing us the points every time. So since inside the loop is the idea of drawing those points, every time that loop goes through, the points get redrawn there. So that's kind of cool. You can sort of see them flashing by on the background. See if uh, we're actually getting any closer to some convergence. Yeah, looks like it's completed. This actually did what I wanted. It definitely it was pulling the points and moving the points around. So that part's looking pretty good. Let's see if that data file is right. If not, we're going to clean up that function. Because that data file is one that I think with those ifs is going to give me some trouble. Okay. It's funny. It definitely went through and wrote out the last generation. This is the fourth generation. It has the generation number, X, Y, Z. It's not keeping the prior generations. I think that has to do with all that if infrastructure that's going in there failing. So I don't think it's doing that. So let's go ahead and I'm just going to change my function around a little bit. So eliminate some of that ifing. And we'll just uh, kind of make that a little bit cleaner. So basically, the idea was that we were going to go through and, oh, there's just all sorts of messiness up here in terms of get the results data file. We were going to go through and get the file, read the file, then if, then join that together. I think where I'm having trouble is really right down in here. There's a couple different things about truing the white space. There's this other thing here, if it's iteration one, go through and put in that. Let me try this. I'm going to try just removing that one to see if we just read the old file and then join the new values to it. I think this little thing that's going on right here, this is my little trim leading white space. What used to happen was if I had a bunch of comma separated values and there was white space, it would sort of mess up. So I was trying to trim that. Let's just try taking that out as a starting point. I'm just going to bypass that. I'm going to suspect, though, that even that is having troubles, because I think it's really this if where I'm having troubles, where what's going to happen is it's just going to take basically, you know, I don't think it ever gets the false side of it down in here. But we'll see. It should. The iteration is not is equal to 1. Good. We'll see. Actually, you can even sort of see right here what the data file is doing over here. It's just starting with 4. What I would like to see is a whole bunch of you know, different generations going through there. Let's try taking this out just as a starting point. Come back over here. Let's try running that. It says, oh, let me warn you about this. It's kind of interesting. It says run completed. From its perspective, hey, I've already run. I don't need to run anything. You changed something deep inside of a node. I don't know about that. So what you often have to do is just do what I'll call goosing this along. Let's just sort of introduce something that's changing just so it understands something that's changed. Otherwise, it tries to be very uh, what, uh, optimal and just not recompute anything that it doesn't have to recompute. Okay. We're definitely getting lots of good imagery over there. That part's looking fine. We'll see how we're doing on this writing of the file. Okay, run completed. I can look at it a couple ways. I can look at it over here on the watch. Ah, oh, 
That's looking a little bit better. Little generation pop X, pop Y, pop Z, third generation. Oh, maybe it's still just the third generation. Let's go over and take a look at the data file. Still just the third generation. Not quite there. I'm still missing those old generations. So let's just go ahead and I'm going to take out that if, because I think that that if never evaluates to what I want it to. So what I'm going to do is instead, I'm just going to take the old value right here and plug that in without the titles. So I'm just going to take out the if, because I'm square, this is the thing that's giving me the troubles. If is giving me a lot of trouble with square. So I'll just read the old results data file, and then I'll just join the new to the tail end of it. That way, you know, cross your fingers, that should give us the successive generations. I'm losing a header, but I'm going to live with that for right now. OK, let me save that. Come on over here. Again, I'll change it to, oh, four is actually fine. Not that. When I put in five, it'll fail at five, so it should go to four. One, two, three. That looks like the second generation. Okay. Let's take a look at that one to see if it's any better. We'll come back over again to D. Oh, we've got a lot more data. I can see it's 14K this time. Let's open that. Three. There's one, there's two, there's four. Oh, because the three, the first part at the top there was really what was in that file beforehand. OK, so it just appended it to the tail end of it. So down here, if I cleaned out that file, it would start over with the one points, the two points, the three points, and finally the four points. OK, so all my if it in the world is not doing me any good in terms of uh, all that fancy footwork. So back over here, actually it's pretty clean right now. If I just leave that stuff hanging around there in the hope that someday I'll be able to fix that, that'll be fine. But this node is actually, you know, it's delivering the right things right now. And it's for good reason. I sometimes leave residue kind of hanging around thinking someday I'll figure out a better way to get that ish to work in terms of, and all it was really doing is giving the header, so we could even just sort of build the header manually. In fact, that wouldn't be a bad strategy since we know that works and it reads the old data file. We could just sort of first write out the header and then go through and start doing the iterations. That would actually be not a bad strategy. Okay, now, this is looking so good. I like all this kind of flash around happening back over here. That's looking pretty good. I like it so much, I would love to have a snapshot of every time that happens so I could put them all together into a little animated movie or something like that and see what's going on. And believe it or not, there's actually a nice function that helps you do that. So there's a couple of different functions that'll do it. We basically want to save the images of the <coughs> Revit model to a file. Okay, we can go through and make a nice little visual history and combine them together and do an animation. And the function that actually does that is pretty straightforward. Oh, let's see if we can even find it in there. I can pop back over here. Let's see if I can find image. What do I have in here? Write to file. Writes the image to a path given the specified name. So there's this thing about a path and an image. Um, export is image. Export the view as an image to the given path. Defaults to PNG. Now that's looking pretty interesting down here.
This will basically take a view and send it to a path. It's my old function. Hey, it's still there. Import export it's export from loop. Okay, but view export as image is actually going to be a pretty good one that we could think about using. Let's think about this. That's the view. That's the path that we wanted to go to. Okay, I went through and used this function to actually built a slightly uh, different version that actually allowed us to go through and change the names every time so that all the different images would be saved. And if you open up 5B, we'll see that. Well, yes. I think that if you don't have headers already, yes. it fails to record in, this, in a blank CSV. Ah, so we I, do need to put the headers in. I think we do, because when I delete the yeah. original CSV and I'm not appending to yeah. it, I get a blank CSV. I sort of remember that happening to us last time, where we had to have something in the file for it to read, otherwise it got a null, and we had to put those funny things yeah. in to sort of say if it was a null file or not. So for now, let's put some headers in, okay? Because yeah, we got to work on that whole writing of the CSV. That's definitely the messy part and what's not working so well here. So in this version, what we're doing is pretty much the same. We're going to record the results and update the Revit model on the loop. That was all the same. Nothing changed there. This is a little different. Import, export from loop cycle, example one. So let's take a look at that. Okay, if I go through and open up that node, you'll see what it's going to do is <coughs> given some sort of input, which we're actually just passing on through, which is the current state of things, I'm basically saying, let's take the document and get the active view. So whatever the document is back here, get the active view. So that's what we're going to export as image. Okay? Then we want to go through and basically give it a path. Now for the path, I could put in a hard-coded path. What I did was I did a little kind of trick here where I basically, oh, what was it? I got the first item from the data structure that's coming through, which is the iteration number. And said, hey, let's take this and make a string out of it. I'm going to add zeros to the front of it. So if it's iteration one, it's zero, zero, one. It's iteration two, zero, zero, two. So that's what this string pad left will do. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll make a string that says result zero, zero, two, dot, and then PNG or something like that. So that's just really building the name of the file. And then finally making that path and something so wrong. And uh, this file name and using it as the path name to write that out to. That sort of makes sense. It's a lot of like random stuff going on in there. Well, let's see if we can make it happen. So, if I come back over here, out to the very top, we have that CSV file. And that CSV file, let's see if we can sort of fix that. Because you want to do that there. I want to initialize that before I go through there. I'd want to do it there, yada, yada, yada. results on loop. Where do I want to be? I want to be out on desktop. It's really, if I was doing this right, I think it's 5B. 17.1, 5B. Now, per the Jordan suggestion, we do need to go through, and I think go through and say, hey, that's 1715B, wherever it went to. Where did I put it? Oh, I did. Probably didn't it yet. Should be there. I think it just hasn't written it yet. Hmm. Okay. Got to my desktop for a second. There's a hole in this scenario.
Okay, I want to add the header in there. I need to introduce some better programming to fix that. Save that away. It is ready to grab some data yet out of it. I'll point that to it. Okay, and we will go. Actually, I think a solution is might be to read and write Excel files. I think they may be a little bit better in terms of uh, controlling all this stuff as opposed to the CSVs. But let's see what's going to go on. I am going to go through and export a bunch of images. I'm going to do a little PNG images. And I'm going to go through and put them in some sort of folder. So let's go and create a folder for ourselves where you want to put them. Because if they're just lying all over your desktop, that actually makes a big old mess. So, okay, 17, 1, results. Say okay. Okay, now you're ready to run. We expect that the data file is going to be fine. We expect that in this case, close that up back over there. I got too much data flying everywhere. I have this little 17 one results. I'm just going to open that folder for you. And you went dark too. Oh, let's fix that. As a question to the headers, does it matter what they're called? Like, does generation, comma, generation, comma, generation work the same just as yes. both generation? Yeah, comma. exactly. Until I get that far of the script fixed, it's, it's really just a placeholder at this point. Okay. There. That needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. Okay. We got this. I got a big old empty folder over here. The reason I want to give you a big old empty folder is this is I want you to see these things kind of generating. I'll put in extra large icons just so you can sort of see what's going on. Okay, and you'll see what happens when we go through and run this is, oops, there it goes. There's result one, here comes result two. There comes result three, okay, and it's done. Because it was going to run three, it stopped at four. So what you're starting to get is just a little bit of history of what's going on. So that can be sort of useful so that we could uh, just have to keep track of what's going on. Okay, sort of makes sense? Excellent, let's do this. Let's go ahead, take our break now, and when you come on back, we're going to use this very same infrastructure where we record things in terms of data and we record the images of every loop, but as opposed to sort of putting points on there, we're going to move these building forms around and kind of change a bunch of different buildings at the same time and try to converge on something. Okay, make sense? Great. Come on back in five. <laughs>